Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we're going to be talking about a farm less ordinary. Joining me is a co-founder of that farm, Greg Masucci. Thank you so much for being here, Greg. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Really so, appreciate the opportunity. So the farm is, in fact, quite extraordinary. Not just less ordinary, but yes. quite extraordinary. Well, we think so, but we didn't want to be braggadocious. Well, <laughs> and I appreciate the fact that you're humble, and you and your wife started this farm. Yes. We, we and did. not because you're farm people, you're actually city people. We were city people. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we actually have a, a pretty severely autistic boy who's minimally verbal named Max, and he was kind of the inspiration for the farm. At first, we just wanted to get out of the city um, and then that sort of mushroomed into having more land so that you'd have a place to run around. And then we looked at a lot of different places. I'm a realtor by trade. And uh, so I actually looked at pl places on, in six states and over a thousand homes I actually went into. And uh, this one just sort of spoke to us and it happened to have 24 acres, which as city people, we had no idea what to do with that. Um, but we were pretty involved in special education policy, trying to push that bar forward. Um, and we wanted to do something for the, that community still, the, the intellectually and developmentally disabled community. Um, and so we felt like employment was a real linchpin, but we didn't have a lot of money, but suddenly we had this land. We, we thought, well, maybe we could do something with that, right? Uh, so that was kind of the idea was drawn on the back of a napkin in 2015, right? Shortly after we closed on the property. And then um, we thought, well, this is great. What a great idea. We were very pleased with ourselves. And, of course, you, you think that you had this original idea and you come to find out that other people have been doing what they call green clear farming for quite a long time um, we, we, when we researched it. And then we, we thought, well, this is great except for one problem. You know, we, we have no idea how to farm. We're city people. We're originally from Chicago, most recently from Capitol Hill in D.C. And so we uh, thought, oh, well, uh, you know, we, we don't even have house plants, so how are we going to do this? So we spent 2015 learning how to farm and uh, got enough, uh, enough of a skill set together that we were able to have a successful harvest. So in 2016, we went ahead and launched a Farm Less Ordinary uh, in January of 2016. And it's been extraordinarily successful. It really has. I mean, you, you identified an unmet need, which is giving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities something that they can work at, yes. be successful at, yes. and it's outdoors, yes. right? And I think there's just a component to being in nature anyway. Yes. That, that you, it's hard to quantify or measure how being outdoors affects people. I, I, I think my, my son in particular has sort of a special communion with the outdoors. Uh, he's always liked being outside. Um, and I think a lot of people from what I've read on the spectrum and other people who have the types of intellectual and developmental disabilities that we deal with, I think many of them feel more of a commune, commune, commune with nature than, than maybe the average person does. Uh, like I said, with my own son, I see it for sure, and many of the other people work at the farm. Um, also, I think we're trying to create a welcoming environment for our folks. You know, many of them, unfortunately, have been victims of being bullied and, and things like, along those lines. They're just not being given a chance. Uh, and also, you know, the situation where people have told them over and over again, you can't do this, you can't do that, you have this disability. So we try to strip away the can't do and replace it with can do. Uh, and we've been, you know, largely successful doing that. You know, in our first year, 2016, we employed four people. 2017, we employed nine. 2018, we were up to 13. This past year at peak of season, we were 19 employees. Now we just opened a second location this year. Uh, we're hoping to get over 20 employees this year. So, we're and that's excited. important too because I know Cameron's Coffee and Chocolates in Fairfax City also yes. has like 20 employees and they get a paycheck. Yes. They come in, they do a job, they get a paycheck. Yes. And there's something about knowing that you're working alongside other people who get paid and mm -hmm. you get paid, you get paid for doing a job. Yes. I, I think that, so my wife and I have always believed that, that, that a paycheck is it's more than just the money, you know, that it represents. It, I think that all of us have an innate need to want to contribute to society. We don't just want to take, take, take. Most people, I think, want to give. They want to give something back, and they want to feel part of something. And we, so for us, the welcoming community part of our, uh, of our, uh, our, our mission is every bit as important as the paycheck. So for us, you know, we have been, had the, 
you, I'd say fairly unique experience where we've been able to uh, provide an environment where we, we've fostered uh, re some really great friendships from people who might not otherwise have even met. Um, because even when you're, and, and I, I want to be careful how I phrase this, I don't want to sound disparaging, but like if you're a, a bagger at a grocery store, which is maybe one of the jobs that people publicly see folks with disabilities performing, and a lot of times you're the only person with a disability within that workforce. Right. It's very and, isolating. And so it's very isolated. Even though you're around people, you may not and they, have And they treat you well and they're very nice sure. to you. Sure. But it's still not your community. Exactly. And you don't have friendships. Exactly. So, so we've had some interesting friendships develop. Like we have a 27-year-old guy and a 15-year-old and a, a uh, boy, and you know, they're both on the spectrum, and they both talk a lot about subject matters that interest them. And even though the subject matters may not be the same subject matter, they sort of take turns listening to each other, and it's really quite sweet to see. And, um, you know, and, and they really, uh, they're really very excited to see each other when they get to work. You know? And um, I, I think that's something that is sort of magical in its own way. You know, I, I think everybody should be able to feel like they're part of a tribe. I, I, I think that all of us do that, you know? Absolutely. Like, and this is a tribe where people understand you. Even if they don't specifically yes. understand you, they understand that it's okay to be whoever you are. It's, it's okay to be different. It's okay to be different. Yeah, like, it, we're it, all different here, and that's really cool. It, yeah, I mean, that's sort of the name was, if I'm less ordinary, uh, we, we think our people are extraordinary. But it's less ordinary in, the sen in, in many senses. Both the, the folks that work for us are, are, not, are not your typical people. And um, it also reflects how my wife and I felt. You know, we were sort of in a place where we were going to live this fairly traditional urban middle class lifestyle. And, uh, you know, suddenly we took a big detour as a result of my, my son's autism. So we felt like we're leading a life less ordinary than we might otherwise have led. And, uh, and in many ways, it's been quite extraordinary to be a part of this whole mission. And um, you know to to help people who really need need our help, uh, and to give them opportunities that they might not not otherwise have, and to give them the opportunity to get the good feeling that comes with doing a hard day's work and and uh, knowing that you earn your paycheck. And when we we take them to the farmers markets to sell our produce that we sell, you know they're really proud of what they do. They want to talk about it. They want to interact with the public. They want to show like, hey, I did this. I grew this. And that's really neat. It's really touching me. Um, I, I will try to talk about it without, with, without uh, breaking down, but I do get emotional about, my, uh, about our, our farm and what we do and the people that we serve. And uh, we just hope to keep building on our successes and to serve as many as we can. Well, you know, it is kind of a calling. I, I often say, especially with the uh, autism parents that I meet, mm -hmm. is that sometimes you find your calling in life and sometimes it finds you. Yes. And so, so I have met many extraordinary parents who not only wanted to do something for their own children, sure. but they wanted to build something that will last for everyone's children who need support and want to have a fulfilling life and can't necessarily do that out in the larger world. Yes. I mean, uh, originally, I, I think that, as I said, my son inspired it. Um, sadly, and I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to speculate too much. I, I don't, I don't think my son will be able to work for us. He, he is, his challenges are pretty severe, um, both communication and otherwise. Um, and so, you know, he may not be able to work for us, but it inspired us because we saw other people within this community who had children that we felt like could do plenty of things if just given an opportunity. And so. Uh, yes, it, it, you could say it found us, um, but you know we feel richly rewarded, um, not by a paycheck, <laughs> because, because we're not profit for a re <laughs> for a reason. But uh, but the kind of rewards we get, uh, you, you couldn't you couldn't put a dollar value on it. I mean, and and other people have stepped up. So you're out in Bluemont, yes. but then you have a second location in Leesburg. In Leesburg, yes. because people are like, this is a good idea. Count us in. Yes, which but, is pretty remarkable too. That people are like. We want to be part of this. Yes, we we were fortunate in that we, we met a very nice couple named the Wrights in at Leesburg at the Flower and Garden Show, and she had an, a small urban flower business years ago that uh, she got out of when she had children, and she had this land and this greenhouse that was not being used, and she really felt like it should be used, and um, she our mission really spoke to her, and so we talked to her, and a lot of times you know people 
have a lot of ideas that they think they might do or not do, and you talk to them, and then they see that what's involved, and they're a little less interested. But they've been with us 100% of the way, from the ribbon cutting to we just finished uh, putting a level pad down, putting a new shed there, um, tractors over there, we put up fencing and everything else, and they've been just fantastic. And I, and I, I think it's wonderful that you know there are people out there that are willing to do more than than pay, pay something lip service. Right. You know, we, we depend on the, the the generosity of others. I mean, we're a nonprofit, so we depend on donations, and we depend on donations of equipment and land and things like that. There was a gentleman from Rotary donated his uh, his old lawn, his old uh, zero turn lawnmower. So all of those things. Whenever I can get a donation, it's money that I can spend. It's money that a donation, like a piece of equipment or land or something like that. Those are funds that I don't have to expend to acquire those things, and that means that I can hire that many more people. Right. Because so, well, so, so in kind, yeah. so in kind donations become important. In kind donations are every bit as and important. And you mentioned something important, which is you are a Rotarian. Yes, and I am. And I a am a Rotarian. That's right. And this is what Rotary, Rotary is all pin. about, right? <laughs> I saw your Paul Harris pen. So um, the thing about Rotary is it's a service club, yes. and our and our it's service above self yes, is our absolutely. mantra. And so belonging to a service club, also you're around groups of people who want to figure out ways to support philanthropic organizations doing important work. And Absolutely. so I'm, I applaud the fact that you are a Rotarian and that you have found your community there too. Absolutely. Uh, for me, um, I uh, was approached by somebody in Rotary Club uh, to actually be a benefactor for the farm uh, for an event that they had. And that's how I get, originally got introduced to it. And then I just really like the idea of service above self. It's something that's really important to me. Um, and it really means a lot to me. Yeah, personally, and um, and so I'm very involved in the special special ed community, special needs community rather, uh, and the disability community. So this gave me a chance to serve outside of those communities that I'm so sort of plugged into every day. Right. So I get to you know I get to serve soldiers at Boulder Crest, or I get to make meals at Grace to Go, and other things that Rotarian events that we do to help others um, outside of the, the communities that I'm traditionally serving. And I, I really like that uh, that the the option to do that, and Rotary's are great for that. Well, it's kind of a mindset, and you, you have that mindset. I mean, this is where you have ended up, and it's introducing you to people and organizations, and so this is the journey you're on, which is fascinating. Yes. No. I mean, whether you planned for it or not, no. your journey, <laughs> and I have known you for a long time, yes. since back in 2008. Before I even had children. Before you had children, <laughs> and so it's been interesting to, to watch this journey of yours, and I'm glad to have you on here so you can share with other people. And when we get back from our break, yes. we are going to talk further with Greg Masucci, who is the co-founder of A Farm Less Ordinary, which is out in Loudoun County. And it serves people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and gives them a way to earn a paycheck, to grow something, to be proud of who they are, and to have a life like ours. So join us after the break. Hey, sweetie. What did you learn in school today? I learned that the 2020 census counts everyone in the U.S. Where there are more people, there are more needs for things like roads, schools, and hospitals. I learned that billions in funding goes to communities like ours because of the census. I learned that the Census Bureau collects data about communities in all states and territories of the U.S. Statistics in Schools offers free educational materials powered by census data. Learn more at census.gov schools. Mom! I got it. What are you doing in there? I got stuck! Oh. Are you a dog? I wouldn't do that. Have you seen the pliers? Where'd you find those? It's not your birthday. Sorry. What are you looking for? has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. 
If making my detox public is gonna help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we're talking about a farm less ordinary out in Loudoun County with one of the two co-founders, Greg Masucci. Thank Hi. you so much for being here, Greg. Thank you for having me. So from 2015, when you first learned to farm, yes. which is its own adventure, yes. you really have evolved. You've expanded. Yes. Um, you've actually gotten grants, too. Yes. I, recently from Loudoun County. You, you, and United Way. Yeah, United Way. So yes. your efforts are being recognized by a lot of organizations who are anxious to help fund your growth. Yes. <laughs> so you are also doing things like um, Feast in the Field. Yes. So our tentative date this year is June 27th, and you know people talk a lot about farm to table, but this is literally farm to table. So we set up the table in the field, so it doesn't get any fresher than that. The, the, the food will come out of the field and go right under your table, and then we have a local chef who helps us with that named uh, Justin Garrison. And um, we also get wheat since we don't make meat, of course, and we don't, uh, we're not involved. You're not, in, you're not, you're not growing cows. We're, we're not growing cows, exactly. <laughs> so we're just vegetable farm. So we, we find uh, some local providers of, of beef and chicken and, and pork, and uh, we partner with them so that everything is, is fresh and locally grown. You know, and that's, erased. And, and that, you're right, this whole idea of farm to table, and it is very, that's what everybody wants, yes. but you're putting the table in the farm. And actually in the field, so yes. like it doesn't, it gets very fresh, but what about the farming community? Have you been really welcomed by the farming community we, out loud? We have, I, I believe, yeah, we, we have. Um, the, there have been certain farmers who have helped us out, um, farmers have donated things to us, farmers have offered us advice, um, you know, we would love to have a farmer on the board of directors. <laughs> But unfortunately, farmers are very busy people, as we right. quickly found out as this nonprofit took over our lives. Um, because, you know, you have, uh, there's a lot to do in farming. You know, there's, a, there's even, even the off season, you're trying to get ready for the actual season. So, so there, there's not a lot of downtime. So we, we understand that uh, a lot of them, I think, would like to help us, but simply don't have the time. So if you're a farmer out there and you have enough time, that's we'd right. love to talk to you about being on our board. Uh, it um, seems like an important person to have uh, on your board. Absolutely, because we, we, we feel like we've been quick under studies of farming, but there's no substitute for experience in, in anything, and especially, I think, farming. So. But in, in what you're doing, too, is offering an opportunity for other young people to take field trips out to your farm. Yes. I think the Loudoun County Public Schools have decided that it would be a good thing for what we call neurotypical students yes. to see what you've done out there. Yes, uh, so we, we've been talking to Loudoun County Public Schools about sending some bus, bus loads of, of kids over, um, probably maybe one a week, and we'll do a little tour. And for us, you know, we've always, we've always been interested in the edu educational component of the farm. Um, and our idea about that is that we, we want to do two things. We, we want to sort of imprint on the young mind that people with disabilities, they work too, just like everybody else. Because at some point that, that child's going to grow up and they might be in a hiring manager, they might be in a position to hire somebody. So we want them to think of people with disabilities as being working people, not some, somebody who doesn't that's work. that's important. And we think that's really important. And the other thing is if, if amongst that crew of, of kids that come through, if one of them has a disability, themselves, they can think of themselves, they see themselves reflected as, hey, I'm just a regular, I could be a working person as well. You know, and it sort of sets in their head an expectation that they could join the workforce as well and not, not be de deprived of that. And so that's an important message we want to send on as well. So we're really excited about that opportunity. We're also a little nervous because, you know, uh, Loudoun has quite a few schools. So yeah, we're, we're quite trying a lot. To, try, 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 trying to manage that flow, but we're excited about the opportunity very much. I think it's important to give young people as many different opportunities as you can. Yes. And to especially expose them to something they hadn't considered before, which is people with disabilities are working people. Yes, absolutely. And, and they have the same expectations any young person has exactly. for having a career after school. Exactly. As, as, as they say, uh, what do people with disabilities want? They just want a life like yours, Allie, right? They want a life like yours. They, you know, they want to have 
a, a job. They want to have. A, they want to collect a paycheck. They want to have relationships. They want to have friendships from, in the workplace. That's all anybody who works for us wants. And that's you know, they we should have more opportunities to provide that. We're trying to fill that gap, and we're hoping that we can create a movement for a lot of other folks to fill that gap. And you see it more and more. You, you mentioned the coffee shop locally here, right? And um, and then there's Bowen Biddies, which is open uh, here, the, the originally based out of South Carolina or North Carolina, I believe. Um, we, we as a society can do better at providing work opportunities for individuals who might be a little different than, than ourselves. And it's interesting though because so many of these opportunities are being created by parents. Yes. It's like, like I need something for my child and no one invented it so I had to invent it myself. Yes. And now I'm going to do it for everybody's kids who need something different. They always say that necessity breeds invention, right? Well, so. that's true. <laughs> but, but, but to that point too, I think we should also point out that just people with disabilities also have preferences. So not they everybody do. wants to be a farmer. Exactly. So so we have, I think, a big litmus test for us is uh, a lot of times, you know, we ha we work with a lot of folks who are on the spectrum, and sometimes people on the spectrum can have, uh, you know, certain certain biases about getting their hands dirty or something like that. They don't want to get their hands dirty or or they don't want to put their hands in the soil and things like that. And obviously, for us, that's a non-starter. <laughs> Fortunately, there that isn't a huge segment of the population, but sometimes they have things that are, would fall under obsessive compulsive disorder situations where you know, it makes it very difficult for them to do those things. And we don't want anything to be uncomfortable or forced on anybody. That's not what we're and that, And that is, but, and the reason I say that is because Ellen Graham also says that when yes. people find out about Cameron's, they're like, oh, my son or daughter should work here. Yes. And Ellen's always like, does your son or daughter want to work here? Exa because exactly. We, just because an opportunity exists doesn't mean that every opportunity is right for every person, just like no. in any other job. No, it's, it's not one size fits all within the disability community any more than it's one size fits all within the general employment right. community. But you the know, more people who know that this is an option, yes. the more people who can consider maybe this is something. Also, for us, we, we say that we're in the incremental confidence building game, right? So you take individuals who oftentimes have been told for years and years that they can't do this or they can't do that or, you know, you won't be able to do this or, or, and, or they're just not given the opportunity to do a lot of things. And so we're, we're sort of stripping that away. And I think I mentioned this before, you know, we're, we're trying to strip away the can't do and replace it with can do. And what we do is, you know, you start out people with a small task, like maybe all they're able to do when you first start working for us is they can seed trays, right? And we've worked with Shenandoah University to come up with uh, a, set of, a set of very inexpensive tools to help them master that, that, that uh, more easily. So, you know, it, it, it shows them where to put the depth, how deep to put the seed. And, uh, and we have a little device that looks like just like a, almost looks like a mustard squeeze bottle, which helps them put only a few seeds in instead of putting like a whole bunch of seeds because right. seeds can be very small and manual dexterity required might be difficult. And then we, we, we make sure that they're successful in those jobs, right? Right. And then and as they're successful, th their confidence builds up. And as their confidence builds up, then they, they want to take on more and more tasks. And the idea here is that maybe they, you know, it's not their lifelong dream to be a farmer, but what we want to do is build up their, their skill sets and build up their confidence so that they'll be successful in employment outside of the farm. So for us, in some sense, this job may be training wheels, as it were, and, right, and because, we're perfectly okay with that. Yeah, because you are building real skills. Exactly. Real skills. Exactly. And, but the confidence piece, too. Sure. The so, fact that you're making sure that they are going to be successful. We, we want them do. to be successful. We, we, it's sort of like sometimes people call it errorless teaching. We want to ensure their success because we need to give them the opportunity to build confidence in their own skill sets. Because once they do that, then they can transfer that to other jobs. And we're always trying to find new things within the farm. So like I said, people may start out just doing, you know, sowing seeds in the trays, and then they might start watering, and they might start uh, harvesting, they might do different things. And then we added other things. So now we make, we make our own jams and jellies. We make a, a really wonderful strawberry jam and blueberry and uh, raspberry, and we also make pickles, we make bread and butter. And that helps us teach our folks kitchen skills that are transferable into the hospitality industry. So we're always looking for things within the farm that we can do or create that will build our skill sets within our employees so that the, those skill sets will be transferable to a job outside of the farm. Because, you know, farming is seasonal. So unfortunately, True. you know, they're not able to work 12 months out of the year. So we want to set them up for success. And, and you know, we've had many people transfer into the, the general workforce. 
Um, and also, you know, when you haven't been given a job, uh, given an opportunity to have a job, you don't even know really if what's expected of you. So, you know, we teach them the, the basics, you know, coming to work on time, telling, you know, calling in to make sure that people know if you can't come to work on time or you're going to be late or you're going to be sick or absent or coming to work with being prepared to work and dressed appropriately and dressed ready to work and if you need gloves you have the gloves and all of the kinds of things that maybe some of us take for granted where if you've never had a job you don't even realize that those are sort of the the uh, protocols that they are they call them the soft skills right the, exactly the, the so soft skills the soft skills and and everything is designed to ensure the success outside of our organization you know if they want to work for us forever that's great you know as long as they're they're a good hard worker and they enjoy what they do we're happy to have them, but we want them to have more opportunities. And the more skill sets we build within them, the more opportunities they'll have. And I, we also believe that those opportunities to put them into the workforce with other people, they provide real opportunities for other people because we believe in the diversity in the workplace. We're, yes. we're, we are big believers in that. I think we should all you know, have a more diverse work face, workplace. I think it's better for everybody involved both the, the, the folk, folks who have disabilities and other you know, diversity within the workplace. It's something that we just believe in intrinsically. We think it's good for everyone. I do too. I, and people and businesses need to make space they do. to have people of exactly. differing abilities. And not just one, yes. but, but make a commitment yeah. to create job opportunities and tasks yes. that can be fulfilled with people who have a range of disabilities. Yeah, going back to my example with Shenandoah University, they have an occupational therapy program, and we had the OT students come out, and uh, their task was the, 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 the doctor from the program, Dr. Painter, had wanted them to do something and give us, to examine some of our tasks that we were having some challenges with, and then give us a deliverable. So at the end, they were to produce a report. So we had asked them to sort of look at some of these tasks that people were having challenges with and come up with uh, some modifications to the task and or a very inexpensive set of tools we gave them the bar of, you know, these tools can't cost more than $25, right? right. I mean, anybody can afford $25. Right. If you're an employer, if you can't afford $25, you should probably find a new, you know, yeah. a new, a new uh, work uh, environment for yourself. But um, so these were very small tools. Like I said, one is just like a mustard bottle, and one is just a depth gauge, you know, which, which actually, um, by, by, the, by the size of the hole, it, it goes d it deep for one type of seed and not as deep for another type of seed. So the whole set of tools cost, I, I think it actually ended up being less than $25. And with those tools, our, our folks were able to master these tasks much more easily. So what we need is for employers on the outside world to think of that. You know, if you can modify a job for 25 bucks and, and have somebody with a disability do it, that, that's fantastic because the, these folks are, are more loyal employees than, than the average. And this is not me saying so. I mean, I, that's the, it's statistics. That's, that's the statistics. Statistically, they have, they have a, a, a less of a less of an absentee rate, they are going to be more loyal, so they stay longer on the job, they're going to work just as hard as their non-disabled peers, and, and they're going to be appreciative of having the opportunity to work. And I think that you raise a very important fact about how all of this should be inspirational for businesses to take advantage of the many assets that people with disabilities have. Absolutely. And so thank you so much for sharing this with us, yes, Greg. Yes, thank you. I appreciate this, and all of our viewers at home need to learn more about A Farm Less Ordinary, which you can do at their website, and look for The Feast in the Field in June of this year, and that's what you need to know.